Hey everyone, Jim T. Graham with Billy Hale Leather, and I had a request that uh, I show how one of my holsters is made. And it is a multi-step process that you have to do things in the right order or you will ruin what you're making. So just as a uh, end point, this is kind of what I make, 1880s styled tooled leather. So we have hand tooling, we have hand stitching, I cut everything out. I use uh, different methods for dyeing my leathers and I just thought I would quickly show you kind of what it takes to make one. So we start out with a piece of leather. This one actually has a brand on it which some people don't like but I thought it was kind of cool. And then what I'll do is take a pattern for a holster. This is actually made from a pistol. This was not in existence before I got the gun in my hands and so I used it and traced it to create a holster and you can put it together and see how it's going to fit and work before you actually start cutting leather and you always want to make sure that you have the right side up so that you don't make a left-handed holster instead of a right-handed holster and so you will place this on some leather that you get wet I use my tracing tool to trace around the edge and then you cut it out so I'm going to cut it out and we'll move to that step so I have cut out my piece and now what I'm going to do is just make sure all my edges are nice and clean and then I'll move on to tooling it. Okay, when I do a holster I tend to take it into Photoshop and I call this my window and this is where the tooling is going to go. And so what I'll do in Photoshop, I'm upside down, is uh, lay in my floral design and then I put this on tracing paper and then I trace this on top of the leather and this is uh, what I start out with and so I'll do that now. It's not going to look like this, this is actually a different design. Alright, so I've used my pattern which you can see here and I've used my tracing tool which is kind of like a pen with no ink and I've traced it onto the leather. So what I do next is I take my swivel knife, sharpen it, and then I'm going to cut out all the lines. When you cut the lines you want them to be straight up and down. They cannot be at an angle. So I'll do that. When you use your swivel knife you always want to strop it. So. This is just a piece of leather with jeweler rouge on it. You can get that online, Amazon, anywhere. And you're polishing it more than you're sharpening it. And you just want it to glide through the leather smoothly. And wipe the green off. Always wipe away. Otherwise you'll be wiping into the blade. So now this guy's ready to go. And we'll start cutting. Okay, so everything is cut, and I would say if you're watching this because you want to tool leather, I have made terrible cuts in the past, um, my first few things that I did, and I thought this is ruined, and I found that even if your cuts aren't the best, once you start tooling it, it turns out usually pretty good. I thought a piece was ruined all the way through and got to the end and thought, ah, it's pretty good. So now you can see, you'll see over here it's kind of wet. But over here it's more dry so when it starts to come back to the color of the leather that it, before you wetted it that's when it's time to hammer right now is a great time to hammer and I would say that when you start to hammer you need to start and not stop because if you have to re-wet then you're kind of bringing the leather back up and that is not what you want 
So the next phase is we utilize all our tools over here to uh, stamp and turn this into a piece of leatherwork. All right, so first thing you do is bevel. And then I'll talk about a couple other things. First you bevel your lines. I have a few different bevelers here. This is my favorite. The reason it's my favorite is it works the best in that it looks like a pretty, uh, you want your bevel to be nice and smooth. And this is smooth. If I were to use what appears to be the same beveler, um, it does not look as smooth to me. I don't know why, but I know this one works. It makes me look good. So I'm going to start on the edges and then I'm going to probably start on the flower and just go around. I'm sure I blocked most of the hammering with my hand, but now it's beveled. And now you kind of get to pick where you want to go. Usually people um, would possibly pear shade. This is a pear shader. You would use this to shade in your petals, your leaves, all this. So now I'm going to we'll start working on the flower, and to do that I took a big camo stamp, which I really like, and I knock the heck out of this thing. So I want it to show uh, basically the whole stamp. And then this is giving you a place for your seeds to live within your flower. The lines on the camo also uh, are nice to kind of give in the uh, center of the flower some depth. And then I am now going to start pear shading everything. And now it's time to get out the veiner. There are lots of different kinds of veiners that you can purchase, and some I really like. I guess the ones I like the most leave the best indentation in that they uh, really penetrate the leather, and then when I go to antique it or oil it, they really pick up the cut. And I also try to 
use variations of veiners. So one side of the leaf will have one veiner stamp and then I'll switch to a different stamp for the other side. And you want to work up that line. You want to have uh, equal spacing between each stamp. And then as your line turns, your veiner needs to turn as well to go with that line. And as you can see, I'm leaning in on the heel of the stamp there so that uh, it's coming out of the center and fading off to the edge. I'm also trying to fill that leaf up as much as possible with the stamp, which is why you have small stamps and sometimes really large stamps. It depends on how big your, uh, your tooling pattern or design is. And then when I get to the end, I tend to start making them smaller, taper off. And then we'll just uh, keep going with more veining. So I'm going to speed it up and we'll watch it. One thing I have started doing is I uh, am starting to do the veiners a little closer together, which is seems to be a lot harder for me. But uh, And sometimes it can make your uh, tooling look busy, but sometimes uh, busy is cool. What You know, that's the beauty of tooling leather you can do whatever you want okay now I'm doing um, endpoints here in my cuts and these this is called a stop and then at the end of a stop you want to do your uh, mules foot okay now I'm backgrounding I've gone straight into it and so what I use is a single cedar for a backgrounder, it's not a uh, uh, just a circle. It's actually a cedar with ridges on the side. And I find that when I go to antique it, the ridges on the side of the cedar actually take the antique gel and hold it. So when I wipe it off, all these little uh, circles darken. And so it really lets the background uh, become the background because it's dark. And it makes your floral carving jump up off the leather. This is the most tedious part of what I do. Uh, I did have one guy say it looked busy to him. But I, I feel like once you get some bag coat on there and some antique, it really makes it work. Especially in uh, a design like this where there's not that many elements. You know, there's just a few. It's a small holster. So this is a modeler. Buy a modeler. Um, it's going to make everything you do look better. I go in to my turns and my uh, leaves and my beveling, like right there on that leaf. You can press it down to make the top look like it's folding over. One thing I'm doing now, thanks to JLS Leather, is uh, I use my modeler on my flower and on my flower stem and around the edges. And it kind of rounds everything off and makes it look less cut and more natural. But a modeling tool, I call it my secret weapon. So now I'm just beveling out the fold in this leaf a little bit. Or actually pear shading. And then I'll use the modeler to smooth it out. Then I guess we're on to our final cuts here. These are decorative cuts. Resharpen the swivel and go back in. And of course I'm blocking it with my hand. I will get better at showing you what I'm doing. And uh, I'm laying in decorative cuts into leaves and to the flower and it's one of the harder things for me to do you can see in the flower there where their cuts are in the leaves and then I'm doing little nicks down uh, the stems and once again when I you don't necessarily have to antique what you do but I like to antique because it brings and I'll show that later but it brings out all the cuts so when you do these decorative cuts, you're creating more places for your antique stain to, to stay. So it'll be dark. Going in and touching up with a smaller cedar, the background where the big cedar couldn't go. Just to make everything more crisp or crisper. <laughs> I'm hunting for a tool. Okay, and I'm finishing up some seating areas. See that back edge of the holster with the flower and the leaf end? You want to leave that, you don't want to like cut a line straight down there because that's where the holster is going to bend like that. Okay, so the tooling's done, but we're by no means finished. 
you can see I have some cuts in there and everything's nicely veined and background and uh, it's time to move on to the next phase. Now this is a small holster for a small gun so you know that's why it's on a small scale. So at this point I would do all my burnishing edging on parts that are not going to be stoned together so I'll do that right now. So I'm using a number three edge beveler it works best for me. Basically what you're doing is you're square or you're cutting off the square edge of the leather so that you can round it um, when you burnish it. Try to do it all in one stroke. You want to the, the more you do it the easier it'll be to do it that way. All right so now I'm going to moisten the edges and get my slicker. All right, when you're doing this, you can buy, they sell a plastic version of this. I like this wooden version the most. It seems to really work, has a lot of different options on it. And what you're trying to do is smooth and round off the edge. I also will sometimes dye the edge dark brown and then go back and keep going and then apply some wax or some kind of sealer on there. I like bag coat. It was made for bags that postmen wore back in the day. This is original recipe by uh, Thebings. Thebings. And so what I do is I bag coat the front and I bag coat the inside too. And I'll let it dry. And then we'll come back. So after I bag coat, I like to use an antique finish. And basically, this will get into all the crevices and all the cuts that I made. This looks pretty good, but once that bag coat is fully dry, it will not be as dark as this. Otherwise, this would be perfect for me. But this kind of uh, makes sure that everything is, all the cuts are brought out. So I'll rub it in in all directions. Make sure it gets in all the cracks. And I also get it on the leather because it kind of turns it a little bit. And I don't mind the way it makes the leather look. Which is kind of an aging thing, I think. Which is fine with me. And I'll just make sure it's in everything. I'll take a towel and wipe it off. And then I'll let that dry. After you let it dry, you definitely want to hit it with bag coat again. And that way it'll seal that antique in. If you don't, if it gets wet, all the antique will come out. So it really accentuates everything. All your little cuts, all your backgrounding, all your little uh, decorative cuts, everything. It's awesome. So now we'll let that dry, then we're going to start stitching things up. Okay, I actually skipped a step, sorry. I glued this piece down and then I hand sewed it on. It usually calls for rivets, but I don't like the idea of a piece of metal inside of a holster rubbing on your pistol. So I sewed it in. Next, I will take some glue and there's glue made for this which I recommend you buy it's Leathercraft cement it's really good it actually dries really fast what I'm going to do is I'm going to line up these pieces I'm sanding them because I bag coated it so I'm sending the bag coat away 
I'm going to sand both inside pieces, put the cement in, and get it almost as, per per as perfect as I can get it. And then I'm going to clamp it on with my clamps. And then I'll let that dry. And then when it dries, I'll sand it smooth. Then I'm going to groove it. And then I'm going to go with my awl, put in my holes, and stitch it. So when you see it next, it will be dried and ready for grooving. All right, so it's all glued together. And now I'm just going to sand both edges so they're smooth. And then I'm going to groove it. And then I'll stitch it, and I'll probably shoot all that at one time. So I use my groover. This is a uh, sharp at the front. It's got a hole in it. And I totally forgot to film it, but uh, you set it at the right width. This moves, and it's usually... Uh, I go almost always the same width on the edge here and then you dig in and so you're digging this groove so this groove is going to be your path for your stitching and it's recessed in the leather which keeps your stitches beneath the top of the leather so they don't get worn away and then just to show you how it works I'm gonna groove a piece of leather so you can see what I'm doing so let's zoom it in So you can, uh, you just put it on the leather and pull, and you want to make sure that you keep a constant pressure, so you're in the same part, uh, distance and depth, and then that is how you groove your leather. So you can groove just for stitching, so when I stitch, this is trough is going to kind of disappear. But you can also groove for decoration. So you could groove one here and then you could do a second. And I'm not going to do a second on this one. If I had more room at the top and the bottom, I'd probably uh, go all the way around everything. Then go all the way around one more time. And then you could border tool around that. But this doesn't feel like it's got room for that. So I'm just going to stick with this groove. And now I'm going to uh, use this tool. which I just put up. And so I'll take this, I'll get the leather wet and the trough, and then I'm going to run this down and it's going to show me where to do my stitches. Okay, so now it almost looks like it has stitches, but it doesn't. That's just going to tell me where to take the awl. So next, I sharpened this earlier today. This is a awl, and it's in the shape of a diamond. You can't really see it. It's got wax on it because this is kind of one of my favorite things that I've done. This is a socket wrench. You can see in there, but I covered it with tape, and then I took beeswax which I bought on Amazon in little bars and I took beeswax and I shoved it in here and so what I'll do is, is I uh, poke the hole into the holster I'll put the beeswax behind it to hold it and then when it goes through it goes in the beeswax and so then you're waxing the awl and then it's easier to go in the leather the other thing I did which I haven't seen before is uh, you want the awl. There are different ways to stitch. I'm going to show you a picture from Al Stallman. 
if you actually watch this, you're like, I'm going to make a holster. The very first thing you need to do is buy the Al Stolman book. I'm going to have to buy another one because I've worn mine out. Don't make anything. Buy this book and get it anywhere. Anywhere on the internet. How to Make Holsters by Al Stolman. Al Stolman's gone. I, uh, I can't tell you how much he's helped me and he's not even alive. So this is actually the floral pattern for this design here. But uh, he has sections here on stitching, sewing, awls, everything. And so there's a right way and a wrong way for your diamond awl to go into your leather. So this is showing left and right. And, uh, and there's more. So what I did is I bought this book. And I just read it every day. Once a day, I would go through it. There's some more on stitching in here that I was looking for, but it shows you how to put, how to work your needle, how to uh, actually use your awl, and how you're going to sew. Shows you the wrong way for your diamond, and that's where we're coming here. The the awl actually has a shape to it, a diamond shape. Buy this book, by the way. And thank Al Stolman, who's no longer with us. So I know that because of the black line I put right here I know that this flat side is the flat side of my diamond that's going to go down and so you kind of work with the edge with you know how it's laying flat and the reason I put this here is because if you move it this might be this might be and there it's all a little bit different it's a diamond so it's not like it's a square and it's the same on every angle so I use this black line to keep me putting the same side, the same diamond shape, if it makes sense in. So anyway, let's go and do that. And I do that over here. Hopefully you can see it. And you don't want to mess this up. Because you want these stitches to look really nice and even and right. You can sort of mess up the hole, but you don't want to do that either. You want them right in the right in the gutter that you cut there, the groove. So I'm looking at, at where the roller went. And I'm making sure my black line is pointed at me. Like this. And then I'm making sure that I'm in the gutter. And here we go. So I'm going through each hole, making sure my awl is following the line. I'm pointing out that you want your back holes to be at the equal distance is the front because you could go in you could go in at an angle and get them too far away or too near the edge so I always refer to the back to make sure that I'm keeping a good edge usually I'll blow one or two and get them too close to the edge which is a drag because then you have to uh, burnish the edges and the edge will get even closer to that stitch so you want to make sure you're staying away okay so I've got all my holes I like how far away they are from the edge on the back. Um, what I'll do next is sew it up and I'll show you that. So this is how I do it. Um, I did buy a stitching pony. That's a stitching pony right here and it's made for you to clamp your leather into it. And every time I clamp my leather in this thing it smashes my holster and I'm not cool with that so once I made this thing for nothing I mean for the cost of the beeswax I've only used this it works great so next let's talk about stitching there's a lot of different uh, materials you can use for your stitches this is uh, the same thing that an old saddle maker would use it's uh, waxed thread It'll last longer than I will, 
so I'm not worried about going nylon or something. I'm trying to keep it to an 1890s standard, you know. And then these are my needles. I bought these on Amazon. They sent me like 8,000 of these things. They're big. They're not pointy. They're round tipped. And then what you're going to do is, I'll show you, you're going to put your thread on here and then you're going to have two needles with a piece of thread on it. This is kind of a handy trick that I wasn't sure about, but uh, let me see my holster. Okay, so how much thread should you use? I measure out one, two, three, and then I go ahead and go about, well, you could just go four. You'll have extra at four. But if you measure out four times the length, you will have enough. And if you run out in the middle of stitching, it's not a horrible thing. You can, there's ways to get through that, but uh, I like to not run out. But for some reason, I also hate to have extra thread. So... Uh, but you do need extra. You can't like stitch down to nothing because you have to go in and out. So you have to have extra. You have to have more thread than you need for that those last couple of stitches. So I just split that piece of thread and then I pull it down. And then the goal is to keep it small on the end. If you get a big knot at the end, it's impossible. It's not impossible. But then you have to use your pliers to pull your uh, needles through, and it's a pain. I don't like it. So we're getting this. And this is uh, how they used to saddle or uh, sew saddles. Saddle stitch. They say it's the strongest stitch there is. And people kind of try to get away from stitching. They try to get away from needles or awls and maybe use a Dremel to drill holes or uh, they think they need a sewing machine. I always thought I needed a sewing machine and that's why I never did leather because I uh, was I always thought I can't afford a leather sewing machine. I did not know that this is how they did it back in the day and this is how I want to do it. Now I'm going to give you another tip and then we're going to fast forward through sewing which takes, it's not bad actually sewing, but you could start up top but I always start at the bottom and then that allows me to stitch all the way to the top and then I can back stitch. They always say back stitch one but I'll back stitch two and maybe three just because I'm that way. But um, if you back stitch, it gives you a stronger stitch. And since your gun is going to be going in and out of here, that's a good thing. So here we go.
all stitched up nice and straight looks good on the back and you take your over stitch wheel and you carefully theoretically roll back over your stitches to lay them down I don't know that I noticed that big of a difference Okay, kind of a secret weapon here. This is Cocobolo. You can find this on Amazon, I think. You can definitely find it on eBay. I found it from a guy on the internet that makes them. I think he made mine after I ordered it. But Cocobolo is supposed to have oil in it. Um, I gotta say, I, I really do like this thing. But I always have to hit it with this just to see how it goes. Okay, so at this phase, I believe a more skilled holster maker or somebody who's tried eight different ways to do this would take darker brown leather dye and then they would take a dauber, which I have in a bag back here, but they would take it and dye the edge dark brown. And they would have done this to all these edges, which uh, I don't know, maybe I'll start doing that, but for now I do a thing. And I don't know that I've seen anyone else do, but I like it. This is that wax that I showed you, and it has Neat's Foot Oil melted into it. So I melted 50-50 wax Neat's Foot Oil. This is what all saddle makers used to use in the 1880s to, uh, after they finished a the saddle, this, they would take, make it just like this, make it into a cake, and then they would apply it to the leather, and that would be their sealer. And uh, the Neat's Foot makes it a little darker. But I applied this to my... I just rub it on my finger, get it hot. Well, get it, get it on my finger, and then I rub it on my edge here. So you can see, just that alone looks pretty awesome. And then I'll hit it again with the uh, Coca Bolo because it'll heat up and it'll heat that wax up. So I think a dark brown leather might make it look, or dark brown dye might make it look better, but that looks pretty awesome. Looks good to me, especially for what I'm going for here, which is kind of rustic, antique -y, you know. And that's it. She's done. You could stick your pistol in here and wear it around for a while. Or you could do what I said earlier and get it wet and wet form it. This little piece right here definitely needs to work out a little bit so that it goes in better, but... But uh, there's no strap or anything, but it's in there, you know. I don't think it's going anywhere. It's holding very securely. So, there you go. That's how you make a holster. If you really want to make one, that's all the steps you have to go through to make one look like this. I'm Jim T. Graham, Billy Hell Leather. Thanks for watching. I hope this has helped. I know I would have loved to have had this when I started.